So the work I'm going to be talking about today is uh, joint work with several collaborators uh, that I put on the slide here, um, including my advisor, Saman. So I'm going to be talking about the sparse tensor algebra compiler. Uh, but first, I want to show, uh, set the tone a little bit for why we should care about sparse tensor algebra. So there's a lot of very important problems that we want to compute with that are messy and very irregular. And you find them in data analytics, where you want to do things like uh, compute um, which movies uh, people like based on which movie other people like. Uh, you find them in machine learning, where you're starting to see sparse neural networks or sparse convolutional neural networks. And we've seen them in uh, t uh, science engineering for a long time, where you get sparse matrices and sparse tensors because meshes are sparse and robots don't, uh, all the rob robotic limbs don't connect each other. So a tensor is a generalization of a matrix to higher or smaller dimensions. So you have a scalar with zero dimensions, and then you can keep adding dimensions to make a bigger and bigger tensor uh, to any number of uh, dimensions. Uh, so here's one example. This is uh, an Amazon product review data set. So you have a three-dimensional tensor here. Uh, and in this tensor, you have three, uh, three modes or dimensions. One of them have uh, all the customers on Amazon. Another uh, mode has all the products on Amazon. And the third dimension has all the words in the English language. And there's a non-zero in this tensor if that word was used by that per person to review that product. So you might imagine it's a very sparse tensor. Uh, and it is very sparse. If you want to store this with a dense array, uh, the way you would store dense tensors, you um, would need about 107 exabytes. So you couldn't store it in a data center. But if you compress it and only store the non-zero values, you can store it in only 13 gigabytes, and you can fit it in a, the memory of a laptop like this. So I'm going to argue why you need a compiler to compile sparse tensor algebra. And the arg argument is essentially going to be that you have way too many functions you have to implement to have any chance of implementing them by hand. So here's some uh, expressions from the tensor algebra, including the linear algebra subset. Uh, these expressions are from data analytics, where they used to factorize tensors. And here's some expressions from quantum chromodynamics, where they used for things like calculating the weight of carbon. So this is one of the simplest expressions. This is a sparse matrix vector multiplication. And it's implemented in a high performance, uh, a good library, C++ library called Eigen. And, uh, but there's variants of this same expression in the other different libraries, where you can do, th you, can, you have functions that can, at the same time, multiply a matrix by a vector and add in another vector, and so forth. And uh, people implemented all these variants because you get better performance by implementing these compound expressions as one function, instead of composing binary functions together. And we'll see, see why, how that works in, in, a little bit later. And in fact, in this library, in the OSCE library, uh, this uh, matrix vector multiplication expression has 282 specialized variants, where you have different values of the alpha and beta scalars and different block sizes for the sparse matrix. And the reason why they implemented all these 282 variants is to get better performance. Uh, in addition to all these expressions, the matrices and vectors can have different uh, data structures or different uh, matrix or ve uh, vector or tensor formats. So there, here's some very common mat sparse matrix formats. You have uh, CSR, DCSR, and so forth. And they're used in different applications because you get better performance in certain applications by using a very specific data structure. And you might also imagine the vector being sparse. It could be sparse compressed or it could be a hash map. Uh, and then you can have higher dimensional tensors that are also sparse with different data structures. Uh, and the number of uh, different combinations is unbounded because uh, the tensors can have any number of dimensions. And you can start to imagine more speculative data structures like the data is stored in a database and you want to compute on it there. So it shouldn't be necessary to uh, move the data into a specific format to compute on it. We should just be able to say, uh, to tell the code to compute on the data however it's laid out. And, um, uh, finally, you want to compute this on different machines. So you can do it on CPUs, GPUs, maybe you want to uh, compute it on supercomputer or some sparse tensor hardware. And you can hand optimize and do a really good job of any of these expressions, but you have no chance of doing all of them. There's way too many, and these are just a few of them. And there's a Cartesian combination between these different classes. So here's a single expression. This is a tensor vector multiplication where you for each uh, ij, you do a sum over the k in the last dimension of b and c. And if both of these uh, tensors, the three tensor and the one tensor, which is a vector, are dense, you write this code. And this is simple code that uh, you, you learn how to write 
pretty quickly in a computer science degree. If uh, the tensor is compressed, stored in a compressed data structure, the code gets a little bit more complicated where you have to iterate through these compressed data structures. If uh, the vector also gets compressed, it become, if you compress the vector as well, you get more complicated code where you have to iterate over the intersection between the last row of B and this, uh, this vector. So now you have to do uh, a little bit more work. And if the vector is a hash map, you have to, um, uh, well, essentially do a lookup in the hash map. Uh, so you get very different code depending on the data structures of these vectors. So it becomes hard to keep track and implement all these different variants. And if uh, you want to add, say, a three-dimensional tensor to a, another three-dimensional tensor, and one is stored compressed and the other one is, is stored in coordinate format, you have to write this code where you enumerate different cases. And it gets pretty hard pretty quick to write this code. So we're going to generate it. We're going to generate it with a compiler. We call it Sparse Tensor Algebra Compiler that we abbreviate to TACO, which is Tensor Algebra Compiler. Uh, the compiler takes three different languages in. The first, it takes an expression, which is any tensor al algebra expression, where the expression can have any number of operands, and each operand can, have, uh, can be a tensor of any number of dimensions. Uh, then for each uh, operand, you have to exp uh, express uh, a type, uh, through a type system what the uh, layout, data layout of that tensor is. So you have to describe its format. So for instance, a compressed sparse mat a row matrix would be one format. And we have a way to do that that I'll talk about a little bit. And the last thing you have to give it is a schedule, which is, which is saying how to compute that expression on that format. So this is work in progress. So we haven't uh, developed this scheduling language yet. You can get pretty far without having to gi give additional optimization hints. Uh, so a lot of it is about computing that expression on different formats. Uh, and from this, we can, uh, the, our compiler can compile to the C programming language, to CUDA. Uh, we're working on a backend that can compile to uh, supercomputers using Legion or MPI substrates. Uh, and we're also working together with uh, NVIDIA uh, on developing sparse tensor hardware so that you can accelerate this in physical hardware. So the compiler is available online under the MIT license, so anyone can use it uh, as long as they do attribution. And it's starting to be used both in industry and in academia by researchers. So um, I want to give one example of why it's really important uh, to be able to uh, compile a piece of code that can compute several different uh, tensor operator at this, uh, operators at the same time. And uh, this, it's asymptotically important because you're going to get really hurt if you don't do that in some expressions. So this is something called the sample dense dense matrix multiplication. And this expression comes from the machine learning literature. And in this computation, which you see, in blue there, uh, you want to multiply a, short, uh, a thin and uh, tall matrix C with a short and wide matrix D. So in this example, it would require 64 inner products. But then in this computation, you element-wise multiply this product with a sparse matrix. So that means that uh, the sparse matrix samples from the space of dot products. So if you want to compute this uh, component of the result, you have to do an inner product but you don't have to do any inner products for the, the white ones, which are zeros, because you do the inner product and then it gets multiplied by zero and thrown away. So if you know this and you compute the whole thing, you can get uh, the amount of computation down to 10 inner products. But if you do this as binary expressions in a traditional library and first do the matrix matrix multiplication, you do 64 in the product, store that in memory, and then you go and sample from it, you've done way too much work. And worst case, you're doing asymptotically too much work. So that's really bad, and this, uh, this sort of software does not compose for performance. Uh, and this just shows that. It shows that if you separate these operations, you get asymptotically bad performance. So more, the more sparse I make matrices, the bigger I can make these numbers. Uh, whereas if you uh, compile a piece, of, or if you write or compile a piece of code that does the whole operation, you get really good performance. And our compiler can compile such operations with any number of operands. So I'm going to talk about the challenges of uh, creating such a compiler, and there's essentially three problems you, uh, we, have, we have to solve. The first is that we have to have some way to be able to characterize these irregular data structures with a type system. And the second is that you have to have a way to characterize uh, the sparse polyhedral iteration space uh, of uh, all these tensors when you compute on them at the same time. And the third is that you have to be able to generate code that avi uh, avoids wasted work and only does uh, the multiplications and the lookups that are needed to compute expressions. 
So uh, the f for the first, we came up with an idea that we call hierarch uh, hierarchical storage ab abstraction, and I'll talk about that in the first part of the talk. And for the second, we came up with a new intermediate representation we call sparse iteration graphs that characterizes this sparse iteration space. And then uh, for the final one, we have another intermediate representation we call a co-iteration merge lattice. So this merge lattices can be used to generate code that iterates over intersections and unions and any combination of intersections and unions of these hierarchical irregular data structures. So um, in addition to that, I'm going to talk about an extension to all of this where we also are going to consider where tensors come from. Because you don't start with a tensor often, you start with some sparse system like a mesh or a uh, rigid body robotic arrangement. You create a matrix or a tensor from that and then you compute with the matrix in, in the algebra or the tensor in algebra. Uh, and we're going to uh, get on top of how you can actually assemble these tensors so we can optimize all the way around. So, but first we're going to talk about these hierarchical storage abstractions. So, um, this is a dense matrix, so it's a two-dimensional tensor. Uh, and dense matrices are quite flexible. If I want to store it in memory, I can just lay it out contiguously. And what that means, uh, since each dimension, each row is the same size, if I want to find a coordinate, uh, one, two, for instance, I can just compute a strided formula and jump directly to that location in memory. So it's very flexible. I have random access into all the dimensions, which is great, but that wastes a lot of memory. And the white cells here are zeros. So what we can do is that, uh, since this is a sparse matrix, we can compress that sparse matrix. And what that means is that we're going to remove all the zeros, and then we put the non-zeros contiguously in memory. But now we don't have a way to identify which uh, uh, coordinate this location D corresponds to, so we have to store some metadata. So for instance, we can store for each row, and e for each non-zero, which row and which col uh, column it came from. So that's a coordinate format. So in the literature, this is called a coordinate format. So uh, if I want to figure out uh, the value at 1, 2, I can just look up the corresponding uh, locations uh, in the column and the row uh, arrays. But I don't have ra uh, 0, 1 random access anymore, so I lost something. And this format also has another limitation, which is that it stores duplicate information in the top array. So we can compress that out, and instead of storing all the, co uh, the, co uh, the row coordinates, we can just store for each row uh, which column coordinates are on that row. And this is called a compressed sparse row format. And that's the most, maybe, most common matrix format in the literature. So we can also start to think about how we can store higher order tensors, uh, three tensors, four tensors, and so forth. Uh, and here's some arrays that encode the coordinates of this three tensor. We can group these arrays together, and that's something we realize that you, by grouping them together, you can start to give them different types per dimension. So the first dimension would be the slices, and then you have the rows of this tensor, and then you have the columns. And we can type each part. So we type the first set of values, which is just the number three. That's a dense dimension, which means that it's just, uh, it always has all the slices in that dimension. The next one is compressed, and the last one is singleton. So these are different types for the data structures per uh, tensor dimension. Uh, so we have three types, and we can compose them in different ways in, uh, to create the tensors of different dimensions. So if I, for instance, uh, have this matrix again, and I, first, uh, I make the first dimension dense, and then the second dimension is compressed, I recreated the compressed sparse row format. If I make the first dimension compressed, and then the second dimension singleton, then I recreated the coordinate format. And we can mix and match these dimensions in many different ways to create many different formats. So here's the coordinate matrix and the CSR matrix. I can use those same types to create uh, the higher dimensional dense tensors, coordinate tensors, and so forth. Uh, I can also add dimensions to create blocked matrices and block tensors. So for instance, a blocked compressed sparse row ma matrix would be a dense dimension, then a compressed mat dimension, that's CSR, followed by two more dense dimensions for the inner blocks. Uh, and if I add some more types, hash maps, ranges, and offsets, I can create more formats from the literature. And this is just showing common matrix formats. We can create an, any number of uh, formats for different modes by, by putting these things together. So that's the data structures. So the next thing we're going to look at is how we can characterize these sparse iteration spaces with these sparse iteration graphs. So um, I'm, I've drawn the data structure again. And this is compressed. This is a three tensor. It's compressed in every dimension. 
uh, uh, these dimensions, these data structures have a dependency through them. So the first data, uh, the first uh, data structures uh, tell you something about the next. So there's this arrow going through them. And I don't have O1 random access into these compressed data structures. So if I want to find a coordinate, say 202, I have to wiggle my way down these coordinate arrays, picking up coordinates as I go until I uh, finally find C uh, 202. And then uh, the value there is uh, 70. So you don't have fast O1 random access, but you can still stream through the whole tensor fast. Uh, and we can think of this data structure as creating a dependency between the I coordinates, the J coordinates, and the K coordinates. So those would be the I loop, J loop, and K loop. So that's going to be the first part into, uh, general, uh, into characterizing these sparse iteration spaces. Uh, I'm back to this uh, tensor times vector multiplication expression again. Uh, for each ij, we uh, multiply along the k dimension. So if this was a dense expression, then I can think of it as a dense uh, three-dimensional polyhedron. So it's a space of uh, points I have to iterate over. And at each point in this three-dimensional space, I have to read a value from b. And then uh, I also have to read values from c so that I can multiply them together. Uh, but, uh, and since uh, c is just a vector, however, uh, we're going to access that vector once for every ij. I can think, we can think of it as being replicated across this three-dimensional space. And to multiply them together, we just put these two iteration spaces to, on top of each other. We iterate over their intersection because it's a multiplication. And then for each uh, point, we compute. But the intersection is trivial because both are dense. So we just iterate over all the i's, all the j's, all the k's. So that's the dense case, and that's a fairly uh, straightforward case, and it's been studied a lot. So a lot of sophisticated things have been done for dense uh, computations. But for sparse computations, it's harder, uh, and it's tr uh, in many different ways. So here I have a sparse tensor B, and I also have a sparse vector that's replicated across the IJ dimensions. Uh, the, I showed on the previous slide that this uh, sparse tensor B can be thought of as this dependency going through the different dimensions due to the sparse data structure. The same is true for C. It's just C only intersect on the, J, on the K dimension because it's a vector only axis in that dimension. Uh, I can then put together these uh, sparse iteration spaces, and I also put together these iteration graphs, which show these dependency chains. Uh, and uh, the next we have to do, we have to iterate over the intersection of B and C, which is two sparse things. So we have to iterate over the intersection of two sparse data structures. Uh, and uh, it's an intersection because multiplying anything by zero gives you a zero. So you don't have to do any work if, you, uh, uh, if you're multiplying by something that's not there. So I'm uh, finally drawing in the same dependency for the result A, but it has no impact on iteration space in this case because by definition that iteration space is the same as iteration space for B. Uh, and this is uh, the iteration graph for, uh, for tensor vector multiplication, but we can create these iteration graph for any expression. Here are some examples, including uh, the uh, MTTKRP expression there and the block matrix vector multiplication there. So, so that's the iteration graphs. And the next thing we have to do is to figure out how we can write a compiler that can compile these into code. And that's what I'm going to show now. So, what you see on this slide is uh, the compiler flow. So it flows between different languages and every arrow trans uh, translates it from one language to the next language. So you start with index notation, which is just tensor index notation. You write uh, uh, tensor computations with these, uh, uh, with these uh, index variables and then you do sums over it. That in our system gets uh, translated to something we call concrete index notation, which is not a declarative expression of equality anymore, but uh, an expression of what computation has to occur. So you get these for all nodes, which is saying for all i, j, k's, do this uh, reduction, uh, and so forth. So this, uh, set, uh, this expression has the order of computation in it. It's also later going to have where things are stored. So it says more than index notation. From that, we can create the iteration graph by laying out these uh, ijk loops in order. We draw for each axis expression in that uh, concrete index notation expression a path through that graph. And from this graph, we can generate code. So for the first, uh, dimension, for the first dimension of B, for the i loop, essentially, uh, we can generate a dense loop if the first dimension of B was dense. Suppose the second dimension of B is compressed, then we have to generate a loop that iterates through the compressed data structure of B in that dimension. Uh, and suppose both the last dimension of B and C are compressed, then we have to generate a piece of code 
that uh, iterates through the intersection of uh, the last dimension of B and C. Uh, and I'm going to go back in the third part of this talk to how you generate these uh, codes that iterates over intersections and unions, very similar to, merge, uh, to joins in databases. But first I'm going to talk about optimization a little bit, because we now have a language where we can, the concrete index notation, where we can talk about where the order things happen in uh, and where things are stored. That's an optimization language. So we're going to optimize before we introduce sparsity. Uh, and that's, uh, that's very powerful because we don't have to take into account uh, in directions and while loop and all of these things that exist in sparse code. So the first, the thing we're going to do with this uh, tensor vector multiplication is that we're going to introduce a scalar temporary that we can accumulate into, saving us a little bit of address calculation. This is a pretty straightforward transformation, but we're going to get back to that uh, in the next slide where we're going to create temporaries of higher dimension, so vectors or matrices. So that's a very powerful transformation, in fact. Uh, and uh, to show how it's more powerful than just introducing scalars, I'm going to show how it works out for a very important expression, which is the sparse matrix matrix multiplication, where both matrices are sparse. So I'll show it here, where you, uh, for each i, j, you have to sum over the rows of b and the columns of c. Uh, I can, uh, I can create, we, our compiler can turn this into uh, a concrete index notation expression and then lay out the loops in this iteration graph. Uh, we draw in first the axis, the path for A, then the path for B, which goes from I down to K, and then the path from C that goes from J to K. So these paths always have to go down. And the issue with this expression, so this is actually a really bad code, and I'll show you why. So this is the inner product algorithm for matrix multiplication, and if it's a dense matrix multiplication, this is the algorithm you have to write, or well, you should write to get the best performance. But for sparse computations, this is a really bad algorithm. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. One is just more practical in, in that one of the inputs is CSR and the other input is CSE. So that's awkward to have to juggle different types of data structures. But that's not the main issue. The main issue is that you don't have a way to iterate over the i and j uh, dimensions through a sparse format. So you have to iterate over all the i, j's and you're doing asymptotically too much work if you do that. And I'll show you how that works. This is the matrices to multiply, uh, uh, to compute that, uh, that re component result. You have to uh, multiply the matrix, uh, uh, the, multiply one of the rows of B with a column of C. In this case, you end up with a zero, so you've done waste, wasted work. So this is not a good algorithm. The way to fix it is to uh, reverse those loops and turn it into a linear combination of row algorithm. So now you do IKJ instead of IJK. This, the, the way this algorithm works is that you work on one row of A at a time. So to compute the second row of A, you take the first uh, uh, component at the same row in B and you use it to scale the first row in C. Then you take the second component and you use it to scale the corresponding row in C. And each time you do scale a row, you scatter that into the row of uh, A. So that requires a scattering operation, and that's where we're going to have to start to introduce a temporary. So I'll show you how that works. So the first dimension of B is dense, so we uh, generate a dense loop. Then the second uh, dimension of B is compressed, the first dimension of C is dense, so we can generate a compressed loop uh, iterating over B, because uh, multiplying uh, uh, a dense, uh, uh, something dense by something compressed means you can just iterate over the compressed part because you're iterating over the intersection and the smaller a part uh, covers the whole intersection. Uh, the issue comes here at the when we want to generate the last uh, loop uh, because we have to scatter results into A. And the reason we have to scatter results into A is that there's a reduction loop K that dominates the, the loop uh, J where we are storing into result. So we're going to keep coming back to the same row and adding values. And a compressed format, you cannot efficiently insert into it. Uh, it, uh, to insert into a compressed format means you have to copy data across insert a value. So that's an O, N, and Z operation. So you get an asymptotically bad kernel again. The way to fix this is uh, to introduce a temporary. So we split this J in two. We then do the same to the concrete index notation expression. And then we introduce uh, a temporary between uh, the computations uh, and uh, storing those computations to the result. And that temporary is a vector. And that vector can, uh, as long as that vector if, if it was a compressed data structure, we wouldn't have gained anything, but we can make it something that has random insert. So we can make it a dense vector, or we can make it a hash map, or something like that. And as long as it has uh, all one random insert, we can just scatter into it. And then when we're done scattering, we've, done, we've gone through all the, uh, the things we have to scatter into a row. We're done with the row. We can just append that row to the result A. 
so from this iteration graph, you can generate code. Uh, we generate a piece of code that iterates over C uh, and B and then scatters into a row, and then a piece of code that then copies that, that whole row uh, onto the end of A, which we can do efficiently. And this recreates Gustafsson's matrix multiplication algorithm from 78. Uh, so that just shows we can generate in this framework as well. But this same operation, this uh, uh, operation of inserting a temporary and pre-computing something into a temporary generalizes to more than just matrix multiplication. So that same pattern can generalize to many other uh, computations. Um, so one thing it can do is to uh, make it possible for us to scatter into a result, which is what I just showed, and that comes up in several kernels, several expressions. It can also be used to simplify merge code, which I'm not going to talk about, but that's another optimization you can do with these temporaries. You can do loop invariant code motion, not just of scalars, but of whole uh, subtensors. Uh, you can use uh, the concrete index notation to start to do loop transformations, even when you have sparse loops. Uh, doing loop transformation on sparse loops Hmm. I see. Well, great. Uh, doing loop transformation of sparse loop is more complicated but, and, and uh, may not yield good, res a good performance, but it is possible and sometimes it's a good idea. Uh, you can also use them to target GPU shared memories by, create, by tiling, creating temporaries and then scattering into those and then pinning those to a GPU memory. And you can use it to create mixed precision kernels. So the third part of the talk, and the last part about how this compiler works, uh, is that um, I showed you we generate this code that had this intersection code in the, at the bottom. So we have to figure out how we can automate generation of such intersection and union codes, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So, um, think, uh, so he, uh, these colored things are two vectors that we're going to element-wise multiply together. So they have a coordinate space, each of them. If they're sparse, the coordinate space has to be stored in memory. Uh, and uh, I'm showing the coordinate space here. I'm showing it in two dimensions, but it's a one-dimensional coordinate space. It's just I don't have a one-dimensional monitor. So um, I, we have, uh, to do a multiplication, we have to iterate or the intersection of these two vectors. And I've drawn the intersection here. So the only two coordinates in that intersection is 0 and 4. And we need to do this in an efficient way. And we have the merge algorithm that, uh, uh, that's the same kind of merge algorithm as you find in merge sort or in a merge join in databases. And I'm going to show how that works. I'm going to generate code like that, but then we're going to generalize generating that code to, to more operands. So for two, so this is the one of the two base cases, which is an intersection of two operands. The other one is intersection of two unions, and then we're going to generalize. So uh, to do this intersection, uh, the code starts at the top. Uh, you find a matching coordinate, so you write, uh, you compute a value, store that to the result, scatter it because it's a dense result. Then both of them move ahead because they're being consumed. One and two does not match, so you move the smaller one ahead. Four and two does not match, so you move the smaller one ahead. You find another match, so you uh, compute and store the result. And then uh, they move forward, and now there's no more values left in C, which means you're done iterating on the intersection, and you don't need to do any more work. So this, uh, this code is done. If this was a union, as, as you uh, iterate down both two, you have to also uh, uh, add in those uh, values for which only one of the operands had uh, a result. And then when you're done, you have to iterate over the rest of B storing in those values. So you have some more work to do. If this was a combination of a union and an intersection, you, you get this wonky iteration space you have to iterate through. But we know, we, we, I'll show you how to generate that kind of code. So, um, so that was how the codes work. Now I'm going to show how to generate them. So the first base case is multiplication. You want to iterate over the union of B and C, uh, because multiplying by zero gives you a zero. We formalize that with something we call a merge lattice, which is an ordered mathematical lattice with a top and a bottom. Uh, the top here is iterate while both B and C have values. The bottom is one of, uh, then you drop down through this edge to the bottom, and that edge is just saying either B or C ran out of values, so we're done. From this merge at this point, we can generate a piece of code that iterates over both of them until uh, one of them is out of value. So that's what the while loop bound is. And then we also have to iterate, put a little piece of uh, a little if statement inside it saying if both have a value, compute. And then if not, uh, only one of them have a value, don't do that. Uh, so that, uh, but that, uh, if statement can be uh, gathered from the, the same merge lattice point. So this is the simplest case. Uh, after you generate that code, you hit the bottom and you're done generating code. The uh, slightly more complicated case is, is addition of two uh, vectors. 
uh, and it's more complicated because you have to iterate of the, in, uh, of the union. So you could say, let's iterate of the union, but that turns out to be inefficient because you have to insert uh, a lot of checks into the while loop. So we're gonna rewrite that expression to uh, a union of intersections, so it's a different canonical form. Then we're gonna put those uh, terms in uh, this merge lattice structure. So what this merge lattice is saying is iterate while B and C are value. If C runs at a value, add in the rest of B. If B instead ran at the value first, add in the rest of B, and then you drop the bottom. And from this structure, we can generate code. So we generate a piece of code from the first piece. This is exactly the same kind of code I showed you on the previous slide, except we need three if statements. And the three if statement comes from, there will be one if statement for each merge lattice point underneath this merge lattice point. So we generate the if statement of the first one. So now we have the same code as the multiplication, but a bit of addition instead. Then there's a, a piece of uh, if statement from the second merge lattice point, and then an if statement from the third merge lattice point. And then we have to go to the next merge lattice point and generate another loop to, to add in the rest of the values after you run out the values in one of them. So there's sort of a, double, uh, a nested code generation going on here. And finally, there has to be a piece of code from the, the last merge lattice point. So there's a while loop for each merge lattice point, and inside the while loops, there's an if statement for each point uh, underneath that point. So those are the base cases, and here's some more complicated cases, adding uh, three vectors at the same time. So there is a more complicated merge lattice and more complicated code, but you generate the code in the same simple way, merge lattice point by merge lattice point. Uh, if D was dense, uh, we can simplify this merge lattice because um, uh, a dense dimension is gonna be a superset of every other dimension. So we can remove some points because the second we run out of values in D, we're done. So we remove a bunch of points and thus removing a bunch of code. Uh, we can uh, create merge lattices also for, for expressions that are mixes of additions and multiplications like this somewhat wonky merge lattice with a more wonky uh, iteration space. But the code generation is as simple as before. You just generate a piece of code for each merge lattice point uh, independently the way I described earlier. Uh, if this D is dense, then you get an interesting thing happening. So, so here you can uh, uh, optimize, not because D is a superset of every other set, because it's dense, but because D has random access. So if you multiply something with something that has random access, you need to iterate over that intersection. Each of the two sides of that intersection is going to cover the whole intersection by definition. So you don't have to iterate over both of them. You can iterate over, only over the B and C, and then locate value from D. So you're gonna iterate over B and C, and then you're gonna just pick values out of D as you go. So now we have a mix of a merge uh, join and uh, something more like a hash join. And you can generate these mixes for any, any expression. So we call the left side, we call that iterators, and we call the right side locators. So we iterate over the iterators and pick values out of the locators. And that gives us a simpler piece of code that will run faster. So those, that's the merge lattice construction. So that's it. That's how you generate code for, for any, all of these intersections and unions. So then the next question is, what's the performance of this? Uh, the story of the performance is that there's an infinite space of expressions. You can have any number of operands, and each operand can have any order. Some of those expressions have been handwritten and put in a library, and most of them have never been handwritten and put in a library. And wherever we looked at expressions that are hand-optimized and put in a library, in the sparse tensor algebra or sparse linear algebra, we, we get about the same performance. Uh, and for other expressions, we have that same performance. So you get good performance across the board, so you get a lot of generality without losing performance. So uh, this is the matrix vector multiplication with a sparse matrix. That's the most opti heavily optimized kernel because um, it's the most important kernel uh, in the linear, sparse linear algebra. Uh, I'm showing the performance here. So this is different matrices from the Florida sparse matrix collection. So TACO is our system, it's in blue. MKL is the matrix uh, library from Intel. Uh, it's in orange, and then there's some other libraries here. And we have the, about the same performance as MKL. Sometimes we're a little better, sometimes we're a little worse, but it's sort of within, uh, within the same range. Uh, the reason why MKL and TACO are much faster than the other one is that MKL is parallelized, TACO uh, generates parallel code, whereas the other ones are single-threaded. So if uh, we turn off parallelization, they will all be the, about the same performance. Uh, then there's the sample dense dense matrix multiplication, and here, uh, taco generate one piece of code for the whole expression, so it's very fast. Uh, Eigen has that same kernel implemented, 
uh, whereas uBlast does not. So uBlast gets asymptotically worse performance. Uh, and MTTKRP, which comes from uh, uh, very, uh, from one of the tensor factorizations, which is a generalization of SVD to tensors. That's one of the key kernels, is MTTKRP actually the key kernel. And in that kernel, you have to multiply a sparse tensor by two matrices in different dimensions. And if it's higher order, you have to multiply it by many matrices in different dimensions. Uh, so this is another expression where you have to compute two operations at the same time in the same piece of code. Uh, and uh, Taco generate that, generates that kind of code. The Splat library has been hand optimized for that specific operation, so it has the same performance, sometimes a little worse, sometimes a little better. Uh, whereas um, uh, the MATLAB tensor toolbox does the operations uh, uh, independently and gets asymptotically worse performance again. So that shows that uh, you, we, we get very good performance for different expressions and you have to implement the whole expression, you can't just compose binary expressions, but you also can't just use a single format. You have different formats work well for different data. So if you have a dense matrix, then, uh, and you want to compute a matrix vector multiplication, you want to store that matrix in a dense format, which is not so surprising to get the best performance. If the matrix uh, is a thermal matrix that has this, uh, this structure, then you want a CSR matrix. If it's a dense matrix that you took out row slices from, you want the list of row format. Uh, and if it's a hypersparse matrix where many rows are empty, then you want uh, the doubly compressed sparse row format. So there's no one format that fits all applications. You have to sort of shape your data structures to your data, and then the code should follow from that. So what we like to say is that uh, the code should shape to the data so that the data can remain at rest. And here's some other uh, more sophisticated matrices that require more sophisticated formats, and we can generate code for these different formats. And there's many, many formats out there, 50 matrix formats, and uh, more than that, tensor formats. So that's our compiler, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what other people have done before. So for dense tensor algebra compilers, there's been a lot of work recently. It started back in 2006 with the tensor contraction engine for quantum, uh, quantum uh, uh, chemistry, actually. Uh, and recently, there's been a lot of them for uh, uh, machine learning, so like TVM, halide, tensor comprehens comprehensions, uh, the XLA compiler in TensorFlow, and so forth. So we focus on sparse tensor algebra, so we don't compare directly with the dense ones. If since we don't have the scheduling language, these dense compilers would crush us for dense computations. So use them for dense computations and use us for sparse computations. For sparse loop optimizations, there have also been some related work starting uh, with uh, some uh, people in Netherlands, uh, Beek and Vishov in 1993, uh, uh, and followed up later by uh, uh, people at, uh, in, on the West Coast in, uh, in the US, Holland, Stratton, and Cart. So what they do is that they start with a dense loop, then they insert guards saying only compute if there's a non-zero there. Then they have a compiler transformation that pushes those guards into the bounds of the loop, creating a pseudocode saying only iterate or the non-zeros. Uh, and then they specialize that to a data structure. And then they have some other transformations. The key thing here is that they start with a piece of uh, C code, which makes it a harder problem because they have to analyze this piece of C code. Uh, whereas we start with a tensor algebra expression, so we have a simpler job, in fact. Uh, so this uh, system they have uh, would only work for things that have a single sparse operand and um, is multiplied by something else. So it's also limited in scope, which is uh, to be expected given that they have a harder problem. Uh, it's also limited in the number of formats they support. There's also some work from uh, Pingali and his students uh, when he was at Cornell. Uh, in this work, they again start with a dense loop. Then they uh, obtain a relational algebra query from that which is very interesting because uh, it turns out that relational algebra and linear algebra is very similar. You join uh, columns of a table in relational algebra and in linear algebra you join dimensions which have coordinates and those coordinates can dif have different types. So you generate uh, a relational algebra query from it, so you have to analyze it again. Uh, then you do query optimization and then you do join selection like you do in a normal database. So this is again limited in that you have to have a join algorithm for the one at hand whereas we generate such algorithms. Uh, so both of them uh, start with a piece of C code, which makes it a harder problem, uh, and uh, they are uh, they are limited to a, a small number of operations, uh, and they are limited to a few formats. Whereas we can do many more expression, any expression, in fact, uh, and we're not limited in the formats. We can extend it with different formats. 
So I want to talk about one extension before I go to uh, something that's more something that's more generally applicable for code generation. So this is the fast code generate uh, fast code uh, seminars. I figured I should talk about uh, how people should go about uh, producing fast code in the future. So yeah, so first I'm going to talk about this extension. Uh, so you don't, you often don't start with a sparse tensor. You start with some system you want to compute something on. So it could be a mesh you want to do a simulation on, or it could be a rigid body arrangement you want to do optimization on. Uh, from that, uh, so that you have a sparse system. And it's sparse because most pieces don't connect to most other pieces. Uh, and it's irregular because it's tetrahedral and not a regular grid. And then you have some behavior you want to do on that system, like the laws of motion, uh, Newtonian mechanics or Lagrangian mechanics or something like that. So in uh, our uh, system, uh, you, can, uh, you can use linear and tensor algebra to compute the behavior as long as you discretize it first. And you can uh, model the sparse system with a hypergraph. So what I'm showing here is a hypergraph where you have square edges connecting circular vertices. And this hypergraph can model, it's, par it's hierarchical, so it's powerful enough to model something like a mesh, where the edges would be triangles and the vertices would be degrees of freedom. Uh, then we have a programming language construct that can assemble a matrix or a tensor or vector from a hypergraph. You compute in linear algebra and then you store that back to the graph. So now you have a full flow from your system through your computation, which is what the matrices are, back to the, the graph. And, the key, and we can compile this to uh, CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and the key to this uh, program language construct is the type system, where the types of the matrix are connected to the types on the graph. So um, uh, I'm showing the graph of this uh, triangular mesh uh, with uh, triangles in squares. Uh, all the verti I labeled all the vertices on this, uh, uh, on this mesh, and those uh, vertices, which is a set of the graph, becomes the dimensions of my matrix. So that means that I don't have an n by m matrix, I have a this set by that set matrix. So it's more like a two-dimensional hash map. Uh, so that means if I have access to a single vertex, I can only insert into one location in the matrix. And if I have two vertices, I can only insert into a Cartesian combination of those, which is four locations in the matrix. Uh, the way this works for assembling matrices is that you map, uh, a f uh, you map the graph to the matrix by applying a function to uh, one of the sets of the graph. So for instance, you can apply a function to all the triangles models as edges of this graph to compute the stiffness of, uh, of this system. So I've marked one of the triangles here. From that, you can compute the stiffness, and you, can only, you only have access to three degrees of freedom, so you can only store into nine locations in the matrix. Then you can do that in parallel for every triangle, storing into different parts of the matrix. And when you're done with this, you created a stiffness matrix. Uh, and this is exactly the, the sparsity structure such a matrix should have because it's modeling the stiffness of the system as a function of the stiffness of each piece of the system. And since uh, this uh, tensor assembly is typed, you're going to get less bugs, less errors, but you're also going to get better performance because our compiler can understand what's happening and compile, in fact, it can compile the tens uh, linear algebra onto the mesh so you get sort of a partly or fully matrix-free computation. So the performance you get with this is shown in this scatter plot. So uh, it's a performance productivity trade-off plot where you have source lines of code and you have milliseconds per uh, frame. So you want to be in the lower left corner. And there's a Pareto frontier of alternative approaches. You can use MATLAB, which means you don't have to write a lot of code, but you get pretty poor performance. Or you can hand optimize it in C++ in uh, about a thousand lines of code. Uh, very intricate code, write a paper about it, get great performance, but not so much productivity. Or you can choose something in the middle. So with our system, you can, and, and this type tensor uh, assembly construct, you get as good performance as Vega, maybe a little bit better, but it's about the same. And you write fewer lines of code in MATLAB because assembling tensors is easier now. And you can also compile that same code to a GPU and get interactive performance. Uh, you, you're seeing here a finite element simulation of this rubber dragon that's running in real time here on a GPU. Well, I recorded it in real time and then I made a video uh, because this one doesn't have a proper GPU. So those are the, uh, the ideas I want to talk about. You have the irregular data structures uh, that gives you hierarchical storage instructions. You have the sparse iteration spaces. You generate merge lab, this uh, style of code to avoid wasted work and you compute on systems, not just on tensors. <coughs> 
So the last thing I want to talk about is connecting this a little bit to uh, uh, Charles Lysenson's talk, uh, but in the first uh, uh, edition, uh, issue of this seminar. So there's an issue of friction when we're uh, generating abstractions in computer science. So we write source code and we, we write libraries and those libraries uh, impose performance penalties on us and I'll show how that works. So um, this, um, this uh, comes from uh, Patterson and Hennessy's Turing Award paper from last year. And the, f uh, the data in this figure was, I think it's uh, Samana Mershinga's idea, but it comes from uh, Charles Lysis and then colleagues' paper, uh, there's plenty of room at the top. And their argument is that there's no more room at the bottom. We, can't, we not, don't have a lot of room left for shrinking transistors. Uh, so we're not gonna get more performance for free. But uh, over the decades, we've been piling abstraction on top of abstraction and been reducing some problems to other problems. And we've been leaving a lot of performance on the table this way. So you can get orders of magnitude performance if you're willing to vertically, uh, uh, vertically write and optimize software across uh, abstraction layers. And what this plot shows uh, is what you can uh, do uh, by a, uh, for mat uh, dense matrix multiplication by avoiding these different abstractions. So if you write this dense matrix multiplication in naive Python code, you get a performance of one. And as you remove abstractions, you remove Python and go to C, you remove the illusion that the, compiler, that the machine doesn't have caches, you get better and better performance until you get 62,000 times better performance. And all of this performance comes from us wanting to simplify, uh, simplify the way the machine looks uh, through abstractions. So we build higher and higher languages to express our problems, but then we lost performance on the way. So uh, the story, uh, the, their, their message is you can't have abstractions in the code if you want really good performance. And in the future, if you want really good performance, you have to, uh, uh, you have, to uh, have code that's, uh, that's quite hard to read, in fact. And I'll show how that works for sparse computations. So you have this different irregular sparse computing applications in different domains. You have simulations, optimizations, maybe you want to do some analytics on the result of them. So machine learning can inform the simulation or the optimization can generate the model for machine learning. So you move between these different mathematical abstractions and do computations in different abstractions and you lose performance along the way. And I'll show how that works uh, with two examples. So, um, the friction comes from expressions like this, which I showed you earlier. You multiply two dense matrices, and then you element-wise multiply that by a sparse matrix. With the traditional library composition, you would have your multiplication followed by your element-wise multiplication. And there's three pitfalls with this sort of uh, uh, construction, or this, this way to uh, do abstraction, which is the standard way to do abstraction. You lose temporal locality, of course. You've flushed everything out of your cache by the time you get back to it. So that's one thing. Uh, you also must make sure that your data structures match what each function expects. So with what, if what the matmul function returns, the t, uh, is in a different data structure layout than what the element was multiplication expects, you have to reorganize your data. And if you're in a distributed machine, this is extremely expensive. So, so that's another problem. But the, the most uh, insidious problem is that uh, you can get asymptotic slowdowns. And we saw, I showed that earlier for this sample dense dense matrix multiplication. You get asymptotic slowdowns because you're throwing away most of the work you did. In the worst case, asymptotic. And here's another example. This comes from uh, the work of uh, Ngo, Ray, and Radra. Uh, and it's the algorithms by Waldhuisen. So th this is a relational algebra query to uh, count the number of triangles uh, in a graph. And uh, they show the different uh, traditional uh, relational algebra query plans you can do for this. And for this, um, query, the optimal performance is uh, asymptotically O of n times uh, square root of n. Uh, and if you do any of these query plans, you're going to get worse performance than that. For this example, you're going to get uh, uh, n square performance because the intermediate is going to have uh, n square size. Uh, but if you do all, both of the joins at the same time, you're going to get uh, O of n performance on this specific example and O of n square root of n, which is the optimal in general. And what you have to do is that you have to do the whole join in one single piece of code, which is shown right here. Uh, so, so you have to do several operations at the same time to get the best performance. So that's two examples where you have to do multiple operations at the same time, not just to get a little bit better performance, but to get asymptotically better performance. And um, so I've shown you the uh, dramatic performance implications of composing software with function calls. Uh, 
So it provides some uh, evidence uh, which are towards uh, what uh, Lysersen talks about in this paper, which is that you have to monolithically integrate software and handwrite the whole thing from scratch. But this is awful for productivity if you have to do that for everything. So maybe there's a, a better way where we can uh, get abstractions but not take the frictions of those abstractions. So you can get both archaic and have it too. And the one way we can start to look towards to do this is that we move the abstraction from the code to the meta level. So it goes into the code generation. So we have abstraction in the code generator. Uh, so abstractions in the code that generates code, but the generated code has no abstraction. So one way to go about that would be to, uh, to create these system-oriented programming languages where you model your data not as individual pieces, but as a system of, uh, of data. Linear algebra, tensor algebra, relational algebra, graph languages, tensor languages, and so forth. And then you have a code generator that generates this gnarly looking code that uh, has to simultaneously iterate over different data structure and store things in, in temporaries and so forth. So the generator code has no abstraction, but the code generator does. And the input is a mathematical language on mathematical abstractions. So we have been, in, we've been working with object-oriented programming for a lot of things for a long time. So maybe now we should start to work with systems and operations, not on individual objects, but, a whole, but on the whole system. So instead of implementing an object and then having the global behavior emerge, we implement the global behavior and have the local behavior uh, generated. So, there's, uh, so what this means, I think, is that we have to move away from a programming in terms of the machine we're running on, and instead programs in terms of mathematical abstractions in the problem domain. And there's f uh, at least five such abstractions. I think there's a sixth, there might be a few more, but I think there's no more than a, than, than two, uh, than a dozen or so. Uh, and these are some of those abstractions. And the property these abstractions have to have is that they have to uh, uh, separate the program, the user writes, from the physical layout of the data on memory. So th this is called physical data independence and comes from the first uh, paper by uh, Edward Codd on the relation algebra. So here's some abstractions. You have tensors, sequences, space, uh, something to do with topology and space, and then you have graphs and relations. And then you need ways to move between these different abstractions. For instance, uh, you're getting data out of a database. You do a tensor factorization on it to learn something about clustering, and then you want to uh, use that information for something. So you have to have a way to move between these different abstractions. And I showed you one thing with uh, this type tensor assembly that moves between graphs and tensors, but maybe you need similar ones between, say, relations and, uh, and tensors and so forth. Uh, and one thing, I think, one opportunity if we create such programming models is that we can start to compile to these uh, domain-specific architectures that the architecture community has started to make. So they, uh, they've, uh, uh, start, they realize that they can get a lot of performance if they make specialized hardware for specialized, not just a single algorithm, but whole applications. Uh, the first uh, iteration of these domain-specific architectures were for a single algorithm. So you have the TPU that computes uh, a, matrix, a dense matrix multiplication, essentially. And then you have IRIS and EIE from uh, MIT and Stanford that does a sparse matrix vector multiplication. So these are, of course, intended for neural networks. Uh, so these are two, these do a single operation, uh, but I think we can move beyond that to maybe hardware that can do all of the sparse tensor algebra and all the relational algebra. And I think the, the instructions of such hardware have to look something similar to these merge lattices and these merge lattice points. So maybe those can be instructions in hardware. And then if you do that, you have to, have comp you have to implement the code in higher level mathematical abstractions like tensor algebra, and then have a compiler like Taco or another compiler compile uh, these uh, mathematical abstractions to this uh, sort of co-iteration style uh, hardware. Uh, and uh, if you have that, you can, compile, you can configure the compiler to compile some of it to the specialized hardware and then run outer loops perhaps on uh, a host processor. Uh, so those are the things I wanted to talk about today. Huh? Well, then questions. Questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. So you very quickly, I think you said the dense compilers will crush Taco. So um, uh, I mentioned this scheduling language, that's future work. 
I think I should stand next to this. I mentioned this uh, scheduling language that's future work. So uh, we need that scheduling language to be able to do things like loop tiling that are extremely important for, um, for dense computations. Uh, for sparse computations, those things are not so important. What's more important there is getting the right data structure. So we do a really good uh, job of compiling this expression to different data structures, but we haven't incorporated a scheduling language yet. Once we have the scheduling language uh, in for the dense subcomputations, it will look similar to what Halide has or TVM has. We'll get the same performance as Halide and TVM has. So to be done, we, we work on the sparse case first because that's uh, uh, underserved. Such as uh, vector, is, uh, vector instructions or vector GPUs? Great, for sure. Yeah. So maybe there is some element of that that could be trying on something else. Yeah. But somehow that's the part that I'm missing over here. Because doing everything else right and on mm. sparse computation, quite often what in the end matters the most is data motion. If you're not moving data because you're not gonna you're gonna throw away the results, you are yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I certainly haven't read them all. Uh, so I think I had two questions to touch on two things. Uh, the first question was um, uh, how can you take advantage of specialized hardware that uh, requires something specific, like uh, SIMD instruction units or maybe GPUs of different types of GPUs? And the other you mentioned, you touched on a little bit is how can you search the space of different algorithms uh, like what OSCE does? Uh, so for the first question, that's where the scheduling language comes in. So taking advantage of such hardware, like say prefetched instructions uh, uh, or, um, uh, or SIMD units uh, is uh, very useful for dense computations, but less useful for sparse computations. So for instance, I showed uh, one case where we had this block matrix vector multiplied. There you have a dense multiplication on the inner loop and uh, the C compiler is, is able to optimize that. But with the scheduling language, we'll be able to do the same kind of job on that as, as Halide or TVM. So we'll get good performance for those things too. We, uh, there might also be some opportunities for sparse computations like prefetching, although we tried these things and they don't seem to help that much. But those things will also be go governed by this, um, this uh, scheduling language. So I think one way to see it is uh, we've done the asymptotic performance and then we're gonna do the scheduling language and we're gonna get that last mile uh, through that. And, uh, and the other question is how can you do something like Otsky which is search the whole space? So, I meant, so with this scheduling language, and we also have this format language, uh, a user or some sort of user can uh, say how, uh, how the data is laid out and how it should be laid out and how the code should uh, be optimized. So uh, the next step once we have these languages is to automate deciding it. So uh, we're generating the mechanism. So given a description, we can generate the code that does it. The next, uh, next is the policy piece, which is then what description should you have? And it'd be nice to automate that so people don't have to do it. Uh, what we've seen in the Halide, in the Halide ecosystem, which, uh, so Halide is um, a language for um, computing stens uh, dense stencil expressions. Uh, and um, they, have a, they pioneered this idea of scheduling languages. And they've been working on these auto-scheduling systems to automatically search for best, uh, best performance. And it seems like it's, even in a dense case, it still hasn't gotten to the place where uh, that, uh, imp that beats what a, a really good performance engineer can do by hand. Uh, so um, 
Uh, what I'm saying is uh, both of these are our future research, and we agree that they're important. Mm-hmm. Right. Right, right. Because they sort Yeah, they sort sort of make it partly dense or at least regular in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the uh, to target such uh, to control vectorization, you would do it through this other scheduling language, and that that's much more low level than the. So there'd be one programmer that writes uh, his code in math, and there'd be another performance programmer that writes her code in the sort of, that sort of optimizes that code. Um, so it'd be a two 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 sides of the two views of the same code, and that seems to work really really well in in the Halide ecosystem. So uh, we want to mirror the same for sparse irregular codes, um, and uh, you can then do things like create an LPAC format or create a blocked format to create some more regularity uh, sub regularity, uh, and then you can use uh, this sort of dense scheduling language to then optimize that that code, and then then the the last mile matters a whole lot. User model? Or is it expressed, or should I be thinking about it in that way at all? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, the question is how uh, would you express these schedules? Uh, and um, you would uh, express it very similar to the way you do in Halide. You would say things like uh, uh, split a loop uh, on the index variables uh, in your user code. Okay, sure. But, I, I guess my question but you have to reason about the fine. Where it fits into code generation. Oh, right? oh, I see. Okay. Oh, I, I, I got you. I uh, got a slide for this. So um, it fits in right there. So uh, that's what this concrete index notation is for. It's a language where you get to talk about the, when, the order things happen, so when things happen, and where things are stored, which is essentially the things you want to talk about for optimization. And then there's, uh, so most of the optimization, uh, the loop optimization kind of optimizations happen in this language. And then there's going to be some additional things during lowering to map it to specialized hardware like a SIMD unit or uh, say this loop should run on a GPU. But uh, to run a loop on the GPU, you can, you can do it, of course. But to do it efficiently, you first have to transform the code into a pattern that fits to that GPU. And then you map that very, very directly to the GPU. So it's a little bit happening. But most happens here, the higher order things happen here, and a little bit happens here. <laughs>